good evening by popular demand. Well, actually, somebody asked me about it, and I was thinking about it anyway. I put together a list of problems that you've struggled with as a class over the last oh, few homeworks and uh, practice assignments and quizzes. Uh, this type of material is in units 11 through 20, which is what test 2 will be coming up pretty soon, uh, starting on July, whenever that is, Thursday of this week. So we're going to go through these sort of one by one. Uh, you'll see right now I have on the video, I have a practice assignment week three kind of laid on top of my in my camera. I'll put those up once in a while when I change from one assignment to the other so you can hop through the video and get to where you need to be if you're having problems with a particular one. The way I pick out the problems to work on is I look at the ones that as a class we've struggled with that we've performed below our class average on for the most part. Uh, above that, I didn't worry about it. So these are not all the problems. These are the ones that seem to be the most issue for you. So with that in mind, we're going to take a look now at the first one. And that's in practice assignment week three. You can see it up in here. And this one is called isotopes. And there are probably some technical things in here we should know about too in terms of using uh, mastering chemistry. But this is one of those tutorial type of problem. It gives you all this description of this. And the thing to recognize in these isotope symbols is that the lower number letter here, the Z right here, down the bottom, oh, that was neat, the Z up, Z down here actually is the atomic number. That's when you pull that directly off the periodic chart. If you look at the periodic chart, Z is the atomic number for whatever that symbol is for that particular element. A is the mass number, which is the sum of the protons plus the neutrons. For periodic chart, I don't know if you knew this or not, you can go up here into resources, hit the periodic chart. So I look in here, here's hydrogen, has an atomic number of 1, so the Z would be a 1, and the A would be depending on whether it has 0 neutrons, 1 neutron, or 2 neutrons, whatever they add up to with that proton there. And so it's a pretty simple thing to pick those up. And I think possibly what happened to some of you possibly in here is just entering it into this sort of a mechanism. So if you look in here, I want to put in calcium, it says enter the appropriate symbol for an isotope of calcium 42, according to the isotope notation at that, okay, and so when you come into here, um, what you want to put in is you want to say, okay, so right here, and you'll notice that I have this thing, this A, B thing here, so it's a stacked up in here. If I look at calcium, uh, calcium is going to be uh, element number 20. down here a little bit further oh you know you're not in the screen here I just remembered I don't have my camera expanded all the way out there calcium's over here number 20 it's reasonable to guess that since its atomic weight's 40 he probably has an isotope that has 20 neutrons as well or 21 or 22 so you just pick one and so I can put in here that I'm gonna have a 20 down here 20 here I'm gonna have let's say we have a 20 neutrons, so 20 plus 20 is 40 up here, and then out here I just move over one from here, and I type in calcium, looks like that, should be able to submit that, oh, calcium 42, sorry, wasn't reading the problem, as long as I want to tell you too, make sure you read the problems, 42 looks like that, and I hit my submit, and there it is, okay, so use that mechanism for, for putting them in, sometimes it tells me what you've gotten wrong, sometimes it doesn't, it hasn't quite done that yet, in here, uh, it tells us we want to complete the following chart. And so if we have oxygen 16, how many protons does it have? Well, it's oxygen. And when you see the 16, that's telling you the mass number. It's going to tell you the mass number. It doesn't tell you anything else. It tells you the mass number. So I have to look at my periodic table again. In my periodic table, my oxygen is going to be uh, over here, right here. Here's my oxygen. He has 8 for an atomic number. So what I know about oxygen then is over here for the number of protons, it's going to be an 8. Slid into here. Like that. How many neutrons do I have? Well, if it's oxygen 16, I have 8 protons. Then my number of neutrons also has to be 8 because 16 minus 8 is going to be 8. And so I drag my 16 over wherever it is right here. I'm working on my touch screen. I don't drag very well on this thing yet here, up there, get up there, get up there, you can do it, there you go, 16, and, oh sorry, you asked me for number of neutrons here, this is actually over here, that's my mass number, anyway, you get the idea, I'm having trouble dragging tonight, 
and the number of neutrons is going to be 8. Okay, so it'll be 8 here, it'll be 8 over here, and it'll be 16 over here for the mass number. Okay, so that's kind of the isotope issue. It's not too hard, it's just the bottom one is the atomic number, uh, the next one's going to be the uh, top one's going to be the mass number, the mass number, and then the symbol goes with it. If we look now at question 3.17 right here, I realize you don't see these problem numbers, but I see them so I can relate to where they had issues with them. Uh, use a periodic table to determine the number of electrons in a neutral atom of each of the following elements. Key point here is if it's a neutral atom, it means that it's got as many protons as it has electrons. So all I have to do is look at the atomic number, which tells me how many protons I have. It would be the same as the number of electrons in a neutral atom. So if I look at beryllium, for example, up here, periodic table, and if I come and look at beryllium, let me go over here. Here's beryllium, the top number is 4 right up in here. And so the answer to this one is 4 protons, means it has to have 4 electrons. I put my 4 in, I do my submit, and everything's good. Okay, so that's, that's don't make them more complicated than what they are. All right, now let's move along to uh, practice assignment to practice assignment 4. So I'll put this one up here for a little bit so you'll know we're changing practice assignment 4. So I'll leave that up there for a little bit so you know what we're going to be doing. And practice assignment 4 has to do with writing formulas, some uh, shapes and things of that nature. I picked out three questions here that seem to cause some problems. So let's take a look at this one. And I'm going to go back here into my assignments. And we'll go down to practice assignment four, right here. And the ones I want to look at here from my student view include uh, writing ionic formulas right here. And this is a tutorial again. Now up here it tells me it's a tutorial. It's one that's going to kind of give you the idea of how to do this. And so up here it says, what is the formula for iron 3 oxide? Ask yourself this question. If you go through the flow chart, which I've given you about writing formulas and names and that sort of thing, mostly writing names, you look at that and you've got the name, and you understand that iron is a metal and oxide is going to be a nonmetal. Oxygen is a nonmetal. We look at looking at this, you see that Roman numeral. The Roman numeral tells you what? tells you the charge on the iron. It's going to be plus 3. Okay, so now when I look at that and say my irons, I want to write it out for iron 3 oxide. Looks like this for iron 3 oxide. The 3 right here is telling me that the charge on the iron is plus 3. Iron has a symbol of Fe. If you don't know that, that's okay. You just have to go to the periodic table and look at it. The 3 is telling me his charge is plus 3, and I look at oxygen. I look at oxygen on my periodic table. Here's what I find out about oxygen on the periodic table. He's over here in group 16. Okay, so over here. Here's my oxygen in group, well, 6, 6A, 16. I like to use the IUPAC system. He's got He's going to be one that tends to pick up two electrons to form his octet, right? So he's going to pick up two electrons, means he's going to form a minus two ion. It looks like that. Uh, let me get the camera back up. Uh, I'm pretty well guaranteed to mess some of this up tonight. And so when I take a look at the formula here, I'm going to take my three down here, my two down here, and I'm going to say this is Fe2O3 is the formula for my iron three oxide. The three tells me, not the number, it tells me what the charge is on that metal. Uh, if I look at, this may not be the one that has the other one on it, I wanted to show you here, no, okay. Um, this one, look at part C. Uh, select towards following iron compounds, whether the carbon cation is iron 2 or iron 3, you have to work backwards a little bit. So if I look at Fe2S3, sulfur is in the same group as oxygen is. I'm going to forget this yet. Sulfur is in the same group as oxygen, so sulfur takes a minus 2 charge, right? If you have three of those in here, that means that you have a total of six minus charges in here, because you have three sulfurs, each one's two. 
So that means that those two irons must be a total of plus 6. Well, if two irons are plus 6, then each iron has to be plus 3. Okay, you can look at it that way, kind of work it backwards. You can also say, well, I don't know which one. And if you did it that way and say, well, let me see what it would look like if it was a 2. And then and combined with sulfur. And then let me see what it would look like if it was a 3 and combined with sulfur. And what I would come up with was if I had FES, F2, if I had 2s, this would be Fe2s2. And what we like to do is take and get rid of, if I can divide this to a smaller number, I'll do that, divide them both by 2. That formula would be the one where I have a 2 charge on my iron. This one here, when I cross him over, he would be Fe2s3. This is where I have a 3 charge on the iron. You notice now that this is actually the compound we're given in that particular thing. And so when you drag it, we just drag Fe2s3 and say you are over in this box. So you look at each one of them, work them through, decide what they're going to look like. And let's take a look at the next problem in here. Next one in here I wanted to look at was, I'm not going to show them to you directly from those bars because they have all the coding and all that kind of stuff in them. It's not very helpful. So if I look here at chapter 4, question 7. Chapter 4, question 7 has, there it is right here. Chapter 4, question 7 is what's well, forming a common name, tetraphosphorus pentoxide. When you see those prefixes, those Greekish prefixes in there, and this one says that it's going to be, I'm going to write all over this thing, tetraphosphorus nothing else you guys should be glad that you don't have me in the classroom because my writing on a blackboard is even worse than it is here. So tetraphosphorus pentoxide, tetra means four and penta means five, so that means I have four phosphorus and I have five oxygen. So I'll do this straight away, put down the symbol for phosphorus, put down a four there because I've got four of them, put down the symbol for oxygen here, put down a five because I have five of them, there's my phosphorus, tetraphosphorus pentoxide and that's all there is to it. Okay, so that's that's hopefully not going to be too strenuous. You just have to kind of know about those prefixes that we've got to work from. And then if we look at molecular shapes for a minute, in the molecular shapes problem, all right up in here, ooh, that was worth a lot of points. Molecular shape, three-dimensional shape of a molecule, another tutorial type. I kind of like those in the practice assignments because it helps you build that up a little bit, I think, and understand it better. Um, and so it appears telling me if I have a total num number of bonded atoms and lone pairs, okay? And so bonded atoms here are two bonded atoms, and here's zero lone pairs, three bonded atoms, zero. Two. Notice in this box, they all add up to three. Three and zero is three. Two and one is three. Up here, they all add up to four. Four and zero is four. Three and one is four. Two and two is four. Uh, it talks a little bit about the shapes of these molecules out here and talks about the angle that you have in them. So it says now match each two-dimensional structure to its correct three-dimensional description. And so if I look in here and I see this guy, this X here, Y, 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 I've got three atoms bonded to that central atom. We don't care if that's a double bond, doesn't matter, that's one atom. Now think of this guy as just trying to orient these guys in space, these three atoms in space. So around that X what I really have is three atoms and I have no lone pairs. And three atoms and no lone pairs puts me here in a triangular set. And so when I come down into here, um, this guy would be dragged over to there. Okay. This guy in here, he's got an atom here. He's got an atom here. That's two atoms. He's got a lone pair of electrons. So he's got two atoms and a lone pair. So if I have two atoms and one lone pair, then I'm down here and my shape is bent. Remember, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, they're trying really to get the electrons to avoid each other as much as possible. And so the idea in here is to look back at that table, kind of think about how they're going to be arranged inside of there. And that was shapes. And that's all I had for um, practice assignment four. Let's look at quiz three for a minute. Let's see if we can figure out about quiz three. Have some more problems picked out in quiz three. Oh, here. I'm supposed to put this up now, so you'll know I'm switching to quiz three. So as you scan through, you can see that. There's quiz three here. 
go like this. There we go, quiz three. Boom, right there, okay? So here are quiz three. Now in quiz three, we're gonna look at several different types of problems on here and see if we can get those straightened out some. And so in quiz three, right here, this is units 14 through 16. Again, these are all test two types of material. I'm not telling you in this that these are exactly what will be on the test. I want you just to understand these things going in and have some, give you some help on doing that. So let's look at question 4.80, which is the one that was primarily, what? I don't know. Why did you do that? Uh, let me let me do one thing real quickly here. Actually, if I think of it, I'll cut this out in just a minute. Uh, I'm going to change this, make it easier on myself. And up here in security, I'm not going to hide the item titles. I come out to here. And that's okay. Okay, and save. Okay, I think I already said that. And then I'm going to come out to here to assignments again, and I'm going to go to quiz three. And on quiz three, here's what I want to do. In quiz three, uh, we're going to take student view again, and hopefully I'll see the names this time. There we go. So question 480. 4.80. Right up here. This is the number one stinker on this one. And so let's see what happens on 4.80. What's wrong with the phrase just a few molecules of potassium iodide? Well that's one that was an essay question. And the thing I want you to think about in this is potassium iodide is what kind of a compound? If I have potassium and I have iodine, this is a metal. This is a non-metal over here. So when those guys go together, what kind of a f compound do they form? Is it molecular or is it ionic? That's right, it's ionic. Yeah, so it's an ionic compound, it means it transfers electrons one from the other. And this is the one we've seen some pictures of where I'll have potassium ions and I'll have chloride ions. I'll have potassium ions and I'll have chloride ions. And I'll have potassium ions. Anyway, I'll have them all arranged in here, you know, something like this that, but I don't have molecules where these atoms are bonded to each other. That doesn't happen. And this is just a stack of ions that I'm looking at here. If I reached into this sample of potassium chloride and I pulled out a potassium ion, I'm not going to get a particular chloride kind ion coming with it. They aren't bonded. They don't make molecules. They're formula units is the term we usually use for those. Okay. If I talk about molecules, you're probably your more famous molecules is water, H2O. In water, those two guys, three guys, are actually bonded together and they look like that. This is a water molecule because those guys are bonded to each other. If I reach into a vat of water and pick out a hydrogen and put it on and I start shaking it, I've got a hydrogen with an oxygen and another hydrogen attached to it. Those are molecules. Potassium iodide is not a molecule, not a molecule state. Okay, so that was 4.80. Let's look at 4.25. You might get bored of this pretty soon, I don't know, but when you keep doing the whole thing, you can do it however you want to. You can ignore it, you can do whatever you want. Um, 4.25, so if I go to 4.25, he's right down here. 4.25 is going to tell me, ask me, ah, there are two common binary ionic compounds formed from chromium and oxygen. One of them contains chromium-3 ions, the other contains chromium-6 ions. Okay, so write the formula for the compound that contains chromium-3. So it's a compound between chromium and oxygen. It's got, it's got chromium-3 in it and it's got oxygen in it. Oxygen's 2 minus, remember we've seen that before. So I want to write the formula for this compound. I'm going to take and do this crossover thing in my jig. So I bring this over here, bring that over there. And I put the chromium 2O3, and that's my formula for the compound that I make between chromium 3 and oxygen. So this would be Cr2O3. Next part is what is the name for that compound? Well, the name for that compound starts with the chromium 3 and ends in oxide. So it's just called chromium 3 oxide. What I wanted to show you down here is what if I have chromium 6? So if I have chromium 6 now, 
and we can combine, combine them with oxygen with the two minuses out. I can cross them over. Now I get Cr2 and O6, and that looks fine. That's wonderful at all, but we don't leave it that way because we like to get in the smallest integers we can. Well, these are both even, aren't they? And if they're both even numbers, I can divide them by 2 and make them smaller. So I, well, I'll write this as Cr03. That tells me that. Have you ever heard of hexavalent chromium? I was in that movie with Sandra Bullock, and I don't remember what the name of it is, where they uh, actually based on a story in Oklahoma where uh, the plant had some contamination, hexavalent uh, contamination, and uh, caused some issues in there. So, but this is the formula for it. What are you going to call that? What's the charge in your chromium there? It's plus six, right? So, the name for that is chromium six oxide. Then, let's go back here. Uh, question 1, chapter 4, question 136. Right here. 36 is right there, and 136. Which of the following compounds does not obey the octet rule? The octet rule tells us what? It tells us that I have eight electrons around something, right? So when you think about, in a question like this, they're asking about that central atom. Does it have eight electrons or not? Because actually, technically, if you look at the NH3 here, the ammonia, the hydrogen doesn't follow the octet rule. It only has two electrons. It can take around it. We're talking about the ammonia. Does it follow the octet rule? Uh, does the carbon follow the octet rule? Does the sulfur follow the octet rule? Does the carbon follow the octet rule? That's what we're talking about. When you look through this list in here, you see you have three atoms here and ammonia actually have a, another lone pair on there. You have four atoms here. Notice in the sulfur hexafluoride, this guy right here, you know that sex, sulfur hexafluoride is non-metal, non-metal. Use the prefix. Sulfur hexafluoride, I've got six fluorine atoms around. There's no way that follows the octet rule. So it's got to be SF6 is my answer for which one does not follow it. If you want to see what the Lewis structure for ammonia looks like, we may have seen it. I can't remember if we have or not. Nitrogen, hydrogen, 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 bond these guys up, and the nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons up there to make an octet. So he follows the octet rule. He only has six, three atoms around him, but he follows the octet, octet rule because he's got that lone pair. All right, next one. This was 136. Send all for question 100, okay? So let's go to question uh, 436, 100. up here. And in this one, the question is which five pairs of atoms will form a polar covalent compound? What do you have to ask yourself? Okay, a polar covalent bond. You have to ask yourself what are their electronegativities? If they have a small difference in electronegativity, it's covalent. If they have a really large difference in electronegativity, it's going to be ionic. If they have an in-between, it's going to be polar covalent. And this list here, sodium and hydrogen are very different, will be ionic. Carbon and chlorine are uh, very are different, but not different enough to be ionic. Hydrogen and hydrogen are exactly the same, and hydrogen and carbon are very similar. Okay, So of these, which is polar covalent, it'll be your carbon and chlorine. Their difference in electronegativity is, I don't know, 1.5 or 6 or something along those lines. Okay, and then let's go look at... Was that 100 I just looked at? I can't remember. Yeah, I think so. And then 151. One fifty one. Okay, central atom has a tetrahedral geometry. Will have a total of how many electrons, electron sets, and how many lone pairs? But I know an electron set, and I'm not, I can't remember if your book uses this term exactly or not. Is it's an atom, it's a bond to an atom, or it's a lone pair. They're just kind of grouped together inside of there. So in a tetrahedral, we know is we have four electron sets around it. But beyond that, we don't know how many are lone pair and how many are atoms bonded to it. So all I know for sure is, of these choices that I've got, is notice that two electron sets and one lone pair only adds up to three, doesn't it? Three electron sets and zero lone pairs only adds up to three. 
this adds up to four and this one adds up to four but the key is here that an electron set could be an atom or could be a lone pair so I know for sure this one will be true I don't know for sure I could have a, an example ammonia was one of those examples where I have three electron sets and one lone pair actually no the electrons are the way we use electron sets is this is both atoms and lone pair of electrons okay and so uh, if I have three electron sets down here, that's not four. I have to have four electron sets to be tetrahedral, so it's going to be that answer up inside of there. And that was 151, 144 is going to say Vesper theory. The Vesper theory is the idea of the shapes that we get is based on the idea that we're trying to get the valence electron pairs as far away from each other. As a matter of fact, what do the letters stand for? Valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. And that is what you're looking at down here in the last one minimization repulsion among valence pair electron pair electrons, valence electron pairs. They spread out as far as they can. They don't like each other. So they're going to go away from each other as much as they can. Okay. 153. I got quite a few of them in here. You can see the little grid there as far as where we had some issues. 153. molecule is a partial positive charge on one end and a partial negative charge on the other end. This is a separation of charge in it. That molecule is going to be polar or it's going to, and we could also say it has a dipole. That means that it's got that separation of positive and negative charge. It's not going to be nonpolar. A binary molecule only has two atoms and a linear molecule is just a straight line. They don't, those two don't say anything at all about separation of charge whatsoever. The only one up here that works is the dipole. Okay, and then only a few more here in this practice time, and then I promise we'll move on to the last two sections. And this one is 459. Four point fifty-nine is down here. Four point fifty-nine is gonna say a molecule BF2 is linear. So if he's linear, what does that tell me? That tells me that, let's look at what this one is down here. Oh, it's an essay answer thing. Is I have a beryllium in the middle. Okay, here you go. I've got beryllium in the middle. Got a fluorine. Got a fluorine. These guys are bonded to each other. Like that. And beryllium's in that, he's in that category where um, he, he can live with four electrons. He doesn't have to have six or eight. He doesn't have to have eight electrons around him. It tells me he's linear, so it's a fluorine and beryllium fluorine, and so these guys are in a straight line. So even though my fluorine is very electronegative and pulls electrons like that, my other fluorine is the same and pulls exactly opposite. They cancel out in the end, and I end up with a nonpolar molecule. Okay, And then down here you explain it in the essay part. Well, in the essay parts, it takes a while to grade those because I'm actually have to do those by hand after all the assignments are done. And so that was there. Only two more in this one, promise. And 39, 4.39. 4.39 is the five form of name for given formula for following covalent compounds. When you look in here again, we've kind of seen this before. Dinitrogen tetroxide. What does di mean? Di means two. Tet means four. So I'm going to write this guy out. What's he going to look like? <coughs> he's going to look like he's dinitrogen tetroxide. He's going to be N2O4. And you're going to say to me, wait a minute, we should take and we should reduce these by a factor of two, and I like to tell you that's true, but 
this is a molecule, and so when we write this out, this the dinitrogen tetroxide is telling me one molecule this has in it two nitrogens and four oxygens. And it's the difference between this and what we call an empirical formula, just be dividing it by two. But but the dye tells me there were two nitrogens. Tetra tells me there are four oxygens. They're right them out. They're a part of that particular formula. Okay, and all the way down, just kind of the same thing. Yeah, same thing. Naming, if I have ClF3, he's going to be chlorine trifluoride. Okay, trifluoride because of the three inside there. So you might practice a little bit of those, kind of make sure you can do that. That was 439, and now 428 is the last one I had picked out in this particular quiz. And then 428. Yep, I saw it. Ooh, six points. Boom. If you want to know how I decide on points, I could tell you that, but it's kind of strange. And it's not really as scientific as a lot of other stuff is we're doing. So, but I do it well in advance of doing the quiz. So it's, I mean, it's part of before you ever take the quiz, those are pre-signed. I'm not changing them afterwards. Uh, supply so formula match name potassium hydroxide. This is a case where you need to know about your polyatomic ions. So up here, if I say potassium hydroxide, what I know then is I have potassium. I have a potassium atom like this. We have a hydroxide ion. I'd go back and go. And the only way you know what a hydroxide ion is because at some point you learned it, or you might have it written in your three by five card. I can't stop that. But a hydroxide looks like that. So potassium's in group one has a plus one charge. Hydroxide to minus one, I cross them over, and it's just KOH. Okay. If I look at the next one on here, I look at uh, supply name to match the formula for Ni3PO4 taken twice. <coughs> okay. So when you look at this guy, nickel's one of those. Remember group one and group two. Group one's always plus one. Group two is always plus two. Remember that aluminum is plus three, and then zinc is plus two, and, and silver is plus one. We know those. Everybody else we're not too sure of. So nickel is one of those we're not too sure of. So I'm going to write this out, and I see it written out here. And there's my phosphate, and here's my nickel. I need to know something about the charge on the nickel in order to name this thing correctly. And so what I'm going to have to do is go in and say, okay, so I have nickel. Oh, sorry. I got a formula Ni uh, three PO four taken twice like that. And again, I have to know about that PO4. That PO4 is called a phosphate, and he has a minus 3 charge. So if I have two of those here, how many minus charges is that? That's right, that's 6. So my three nickels have to be 6 plus charges. So how much is each one worth? Each nickel's 2, isn't it? And so when I write it out, I'm going to write out nickel 2 phosphate. Okay. All right, and kind of so on as you go down the, the list here. But all of these involve polyatomic ions, nitrate, sulfate. No, that one doesn't. KCl doesn't involve polyatomic ions, just a diatomic type of thing. Okay, so that was quiz three. Did I ever put a quiz three sign up? Well, that was quiz three. I'm pretty sure I had one somewhere. Uh, let's move to practice assignment week five. So here we are, practice assignment week five. Just so you'll know, this is what's coming up now. Right there. Okay, practice assignment week five. So as you're going through the video, you can see that and you can focus on that if you want to. And let's take a look at it and go to 5.37. So this is quiz uh, practice assignment five. And let's take a look at him and see what we've got going on in here. So practice at five looks like that. And we'll go to the student view again. And the first problem to look at here was that number six, five thirty-seven, <coughs> five point thirty-seven. It says what mass in grams of ammonia can be made from four hundred fifty grams of hydrogen? Now it gives me an unbalanced equation at the top. Anytime it gives you an equation and it's not balanced, one of the first things you have to do is you have to balance the equation. You have to know those relationships to be able to make this thing work. So the equation looks like this, and it gives me an H3, like that. Okay, Not balanced, but your expert's now balancing equations. So right away we notice, oh, we've got two nitrogens here, but we only have one on that side. So maybe we ought to put a two out in front so my nitrogens are now balanced. 
And now once I do that, what happens is now I've got six hydrogens here. Two times three is six hydrogens here. And on this side, I only have two. So if I get that to balance out, is by putting a three in front of there. That tells me the relationship. So what that tells me is that one mole of nitrogen reacts with three moles of hydrogen to make two moles of ammonia. Okay. Now, if I go back and look at my problem again, it says, I want to know what mass in grams of ammonia. So I want to know about this. How many grams of ammonia? I'll get back to the video in just a minute. How many grams of ammonia can I make from 450 grams of hydrogen? Okay, and that's the question. So it looks like that. Okay, uh, let me slide that a little bit. Like that. I did another video, I think, earlier where I tried to show you this, and I think I've tried to show it to you in unit presentations. What you're asking for is really just a conversion factor problem. How many grams of ammonia can I make? That's what I'm after up here. If I start with 450 grams of hydrogen, I'm going to multiply that by a factor that has grams of hydrogen in the bottom, and it has uh, grams of ammonia up on top. And I didn't plan ahead on this very well. Use that right down in here. That if I think about my hydrogen, notice that three moles of hydrogen is the same as there's two grams in each one of these. Two times one. There's two grams in here. There's six grams of hydrogen, right, in there. Over here, my ammonia. If you add up a 14 for nitrogen and three for the hydrogen, that's 17. So this guy here is the same as having two times 17, or 34 grams of ammonia. Just adding up their molar masses. All I have to do then is write in here that this is six grams of hydrogen for every 34 grams of ammonia. And that's my that's my solution. Grams of hydrogen go away. I'm left in grams of ammonia. And so I have 450 times 34 divided by 6 will be my answer. And I didn't bring my calculator here. Let me see if I can do it on my cell phone real quick. Um, so we're going to go over here. Uh, calculator is going to be 450 times 34 divided by 6 and I get something like 2550 grams of money. That approach in here, this is all the stuff you know from the balanced equation and these are the things you're given in your problem. You're given and you're told here's what you want to find up there and that's how you can work those problems every time. Okay. Uh, down here it says what mass in grams of uh, hydrogen is needed to react with 893 grams of nitrogen. So all I have to do in there is now I'm going to have, I'm going to write this in a clean space, see if I can do any better at all. And we're not overly confident that's the case. Okay, I'm go back to the camera. So it's 893 grams of nitrogen. So I have 893 grams of nitrogen. I want to know about my grams of hydrogen that it takes to react with it. And all I have to think about again, this is one mole of N2. Where'd it go? Oh, it's all the way down there. One mole of N2, three moles of hydrogen. If you want to put it in grams, which we do, nitrogen is 14 for an atomic weight. Two of those is 28. So this is 28 grams of nitrogen react with every Again, we're back to six grams of hydrogen because there's two in each mole, and I have three moles of it. So now the question is, how many grams of hydrogen? It's equal to 893 grams of nitrogen times grams of nitrogen here, grams of hydrogen on the top. And I fill them in from the bottom. There's six grams here for every 28 grams on that side. And that gives me my answer. Okay, so it's a, it's a pattern. If you get into that pattern, you can do all these problems figure out all sorts of things like that. Now, um, let's go to 5.39. 5.39, I believe is the next one. And then Okay, let's calculate the molarity of each of the following solutions. 
And to do that, what do you suppose you have to know? Well, I'm thinking that you probably have to know what the definition of molarity is. So let's go back to that and think about the definition of molarity. And molarity is, what is it? Number of moles of solute or number of liters of solution. Okay, it's going to be that. And so we have to know that or we don't have any hope at all. And so I look at this problem. I have 64 and a half moles of HCl and 20 liters of solution. I want to find the molarity. Well, what's that telling me to do? If I have 64 and a half moles of HCl, that's my solute. I have 20 liters of solution. All I'm going to do in that case is divide. Okay, and I'll end up with 3.2. Yeah, let me do it. I'm not feeling it tonight. 3.25, 3.225. End up with 3.225 molar. HCl. Okay, that's all you got to do. Just follow the definition for that. I would advise you when you put your questions in, your answers into the mastering, that you go ahead and you uh, keep at least three digits in it. Which I'd call it 3.22 or 3.23, and you'd probably be fine for it. Uh, the one down here only gives number of moles of lithium carbonate in 694 milliliters of solution. What you suppose the trick is? Well, the trick is that your definition is it's moles of solute over liters of solution. So you'll want to take and convert your 694 milliliters into 0.694 liters. You're going to divide by 1,000. So 694 milliliters becomes 0.694 liters, and then you're on your way. Okay, then everything's good at that point. All right, then let's look at that's 37, 39. I only have about seven or eight more of these total to do. Now, 5.32, student view here. 5.32, and then 5.32. Uh, these are ground and mole conversions. Uh, Calculate the amount of moles of each of the following. You may run the atomic numbers, and this is one we've been through. I think I did a video on this one before as well. But just just to make sure, let's go back into here. And if I want to go from basically the question is how many moles are in 13.6 grams of SF6? So you set up and say, okay, I want to know about moles. Here's my conversion factor method again. I want to know about moles. I'm going to start with 13.6 grams of SF6. Multiply it by something that has grams of SF6 in the bottom. It has moles of SF6 in the top. And what is this relationship here? Grams and moles, that is the molar mass, isn't it? So I look at SF6, and I've got a sulfur, which is 32 grams. And I have to add in six fluorines, which are each 19. That's 60 and 54, 114, 146. There's 146 grams in every mole of that. So I'm just going to take my 13.6 and divide it by the 146 grams, and there's my answer. Okay, same approach all the way down. Okay, again, that factor method really helps you keep things straight if you'll use that. Okay, then. Avogadro's number. I can't remember what we're doing on Avogadro's number. That was an issue. One of the things I wanted to tell you, and unfortunately I can't show you this because I don't have a calculator that works like normal folks' calculators. And so um, it does things backwards. And what I wanted to point out to you was something related to Avogadro's number when you put that into your calculator to make sure you're using it correctly. Uh, calculate the number of molecules in four moles of <coughs> H2S, okay? Notice Avogadro's number is big. Did you notice that? Uh, and so uh, when you think about putting a big number in your calculator, and again, I don't have one that's a normal person's calculator. Mine's like 20 years old, and it's the way I think, and it's strange. Uh, but if Avogadro's number is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, 
take a look at your calculator. What you might find in your calculator is you might find a button that says EXP. You might find one that says EE. You might find one that says times 10 to the X, something like that. There may be others out there that I don't know about, but typically it looks something like that. Those buttons are your power of 10 buttons. So when I want to put Avogadro's number into my calculator, the way I'll put it in is I'll put in, I'll type in a 6.02, and I won't type anything else. I'll hit one of these buttons. So if you have the EXP, hit the EXP button. If you have the E, hit the E button. If you have the times 10 the X, hit the times 10 the X. And so you may find if you have one of these E things up here, you might get a little thing that looks like that, looks like that in there, and then you just put in 23rd. That is Avogadro's number. Okay. Do not do this. Do not do 6.02 times 10 and then EXP. Don't do that because that multiplies it by an extra 10. It's going to mess you up. Also understand that when you put it in, if you put it in like this, 6.02 times and do a times and you do a 10 to the X, something like that, 10 to the 23rd. If you do something like this, that it's going to look at that number and think of it as two parts, not a unified single number. And so calculationally do some odd things. Let's take a look at this question down here. Calculate the number of moles of chloride atoms in 3.61 times 10 to 24th. Let's do magnesium atoms to start with, just to get my point across. Calculate the number of magnesium atoms in 3.61 times 10 to 24th. Formula units of magnesium chloride. Why do we call it formula units here? Why do we do that? That's right, because it's ionic. Okay. So the question is, how many uh, magnesium atoms. Okay, do we have in 3.61 times 10 to the 24th uh, formula units? I'm going to call them a few of magnesium chloride. Looks like that. And now I'll go back to the camera. Looks like this one right here. Okay, how many magnesium atoms do I have in there? And so I want to take this thing and I want to multiply it by something that says basically uh, since there's one magnesium atom in each one of these how many magnesium atoms do I have in oh no sorry no, sorry how many formula units do I have formula units of magnesium chloride do I have for each uh, I may have read the question wrong I may have read, made it in something I want it to be oh moles number moles sorry how many moles of magnesium atoms? I'm sorry. Moles of magnesium atoms do I have here? So I want to have moles of magnesium on top, okay? And in one formula, in the formula unit and mole relationship, in one, there's one mole of magnesium ion in every 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd moles of magnesium atoms. So let me write this out. Let me, that wasn't great. Okay, let's do this. So I have. Question is, you ready? How many moles of magnesium atoms are in three point six one times ten to the twenty fourth formula units of magnesium chloride? Okay, it looks like that. And so I started out with my with my conversion factor thing. I want to know how many moles of magnesium atoms do I have? That's that big counting number, remember? I'm going to start with 3.61 times 10 to the 24th formula units of magnesium chloride, those little tiny atom guys. You multiply him by something that has formula units of magnesium chloride in the bottom. I want to end up with moles of magnesium atoms on the top. Okay, well, in a mole of magnesium chloride, I've got a mole of magnesium atoms. There's one in each one, right? And so if I take over here and say I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd formula units in one mole of that, that's the same as my magnesium atoms are. What I want to get to in this point is you want to take 3.61 times 10 to the 24th, you want to multiply it, Number one, multiply it by one, divide it by Avogadro's number. This is where you have to be really careful about putting in Avogadro's number. Put this guy in using the EXP, the EE, or the times 10 to the X button. Okay, not just times 10 to the X, but the times 10 to the X button if you've got that, and you'll be fine. If you don't, 
if you put in 6.02 times 10 to 23rd, what it's going to do is take this number here, divide it by 6.02, and then it's going to multiply it by 10 to the 23rd. What should your answer look like on here? Your answer on here should be something like uh, 36.1. I'll get it here in just a minute. Uh, 36.1 uh, divided by 6.02. 6.02. It comes out to be something like 6.0 should be the answer you get for how many moles you've got in there, okay? 6.0. Uh, check that out. Make sure you can get that. All right, that was number, that was Avogadro's number. And then I don't really know that I need this other one. It's mole and gram conversion, but let's take a look just to make sure. I'm going to close this up and go here to student view. mole and gram conversions I modify that one for some I think I shorten it down a little bit I do edit some of these just because uh, and I don't really think we need to do that one that's like we were just doing before and same kind of thing we we're looking at before mole gram types of conversions <coughs> using the conversion factor approach you can get every one of those so that's everything you ever want to know about uh, practice assignment 5 and for the last little bit what we're going to do is look at quiz four. So that's where we are now. So this is quiz four coming up in here. And I'll get that started in just a minute. Leave that up so you can scan through and see it. And now what we want to do is shift assignments again. here and go to quiz four where it go right up here and edit the assignment not without student view hopefully I don't have too many new things to look at oh wait a minute I haven't fixed that part yet let me fix that sorry edit the assignment let me put the numbers up here so I can see them Edit the settings and security. I don't want to hide the item titles anymore. We save that. And I tell it OK. And I go back to my assignments. Quiz number four. Quiz number four. Oops, no, no, that's not it. Quiz four right here. And in quiz four, we have about five of these, five or six. I'll have that picked out. And it looks like this one, question 55. Right there. Prithu discovered oxygen in 1774 by heating mercury to oxide. The compound decomposes its elements. How much oxygen is produced by the decomposition of 25 grams of HGL? What do you suppose you have to do for that first? Yep, that's right. It would probably be helpful to know what the balanced chemical equation looks like. Nobody can do this problem without knowing what the balanced chemical equation looks like. So what it says here is mercury to oxide. You'd be able to write the formula for that. And it forms into its elements, which is be mercury and then oxygen. Okay, and so uh, let's go back to here. So if I have mercury two oxide, looks like that. So mercury is Hg, it has a plus two charge. Oxygen has what charge? Minus two. So these guys together are this HgO. He breaks apart into his elements, which is just mercury. And then oxygen, what do you know about oxygen? Oxygen is diatomic, O2. It even tells you that in the problem, that it's going to be diatomic. Now, is that equation balanced? The answer, nope, not yet. So I need to put a 2 here, so I have two oxygens. But now I have to have two mercuries here, so I have to have two mercuries over there. Now I go back to the problem, and it's just like the problems we saw earlier. Is OK, so I'm going to take and decompose 25 grams of this. And the question is, 
how many grams of oxygen can I make in doing that process? Okay, so you go back here, this is two moles HGO, two moles of HG, which you don't care about at all in this problem because we're only dealing with two things. Looks like that. Okay, and if you add these guys up, mercury is about 200, I think, and since so this is about two times 216, this is like 432 grams of mercury oxide yield and 2 times 16 is 32 grams of oxygen so if you're back oh it'd help if I was actually showing you the video I knew I would do that okay so here it is okay 25 grams of mercury 2 oxide how many grams of oxygen can I make it's two moles of this gives me two moles of that one mole of that or in terms of grams this is 2 times 216 grams for each one of those and this is 1 times 32, looks like that. And so you set it up and say, okay, so how many grams of oxygen? If I start with 25 grams of HGO, I put grams of, ox of HGO down here, and I put grams of oxygen up on top. My, my numbers are 32 grams of oxygen for every 432 grams of mercury up to oxide. Work out your arithmetic, and there's your answer to that problem. Okay, just like you've seen that now several times, and so you just have to keep kind of practicing it, and making sure you have that down. So let's go then look at the next problem on here, five number forty-five, right there. Okay, and on this one now. Showing as many as 18 grams of water. This is kind of thought process for a minute. 18 grams of water is how many moles of water? If we want to know how many things, how many atoms, we have to make that mole relationship. So if I have 18 grams of water, notice if you add up two hydrogens and oxygen, you get 18 for its molar mass. So 18 grams in every mole of water. This is one mole of water, isn't it? In that one mole of water, and in a multiple choice, you have to kind of look at the choices, see what happens. This is, which of the following contains as many atoms as 18 grams of water? How many atoms are there in uh, 18 grams of water? Well, there's one mole, right? But there's three atoms in each mole. So there's three times Avogadro's number of atoms in one mole of water. So I'm looking for something down here that has three moles worth of atoms. Well, three moles of zinc does that. Two moles of sodium chloride would have how many moles of atoms in it? Try it before, because there's two in two moles, and you have two atoms in each, two moles of atoms in each one, sodium ions and chlorine ions. In one mole of nitrogen, how many atoms do I have there? I have two moles of nitrogen, and in two moles of nitrogen, how many atoms do I have there? I've got four moles of nitrogen. So zinc ends up being my answer to that one. No complicated calculation in it, just kind of have to think your way through in that process. In chapter five, question thirty-one. All right, up here. Okay, when two liters of nitrogen gas reacts to six liters of hydrogen gas at constant temperature and pressure, how many liters of ammonia gas will be produced? Well, we're back to needing a balanced equation, isn't it? Nitrogen, hydrogen, and we've seen that one before. Before that equation looks like this. Nitrogen plus hydrogen gave ammonia. And if you balance when you balance it, three there, two here, and there's your balanced equation. So the question is now. And let's let's see if we can think about this and not get too wound up in all calculational stuff. If I have two liters of nitrogen gas reacted to six liters of hydrogen gas, so if I have two liters of nitrogen gas reacted to six liters of hydrogen gas, no, if this is a two, that's like a six over there. The question is, how many mole, how many liters of hydro, of ammonia can I make? Is that the question? I'm just making that up. How many liters of ammonia gas will be produced? And so, two liters of nitrogen will lead to how many liters of ammonia? Twice as much, won't it? Because they're in a two to one ratio. This is the law of combining volumes. Two to one ratio, you expect to see four liters out of it. The fact that you have six liters of hydrogen, okay, uh, if, you, if you look at the six liters of hydrogen, your answer here is going to be, you're going to get about two thirds as much, and it's going to be the same answer. Two liters of nitrogen, you need six liters of hydrogen to react, and so you can go just off the nitrogen and everything's fine. If I look at the second, there's no second part, never mind. Okay, then if I look at 
531. If I look at 531, it's right here. Um, oh. Never mind, we just did that one. Okay. So let's look at 564. 564. <coughs> Looks like this. 564 tells me right down here. Okay, what volume of 0.819 molar oxalic acid contains 54.4 grams of oxalic acid? Express the volume of three standard figures, include the appropriate units. So make sure you put units in here when asked for. It says what volume, put it in liters or milliliters, whatever it is, whatever your answer is going to be in. So here you go back to your definition again of um, molarity. <coughs> And what you have to think about is this. Well, this is a little bit of an extension of the problems we've been working on. I don't mind doing extensions for you once in a while. Let me write some things down on my paper before I go to that. And I want 54.4 grams of H2C2O4. And the question is, how many, what, what volume do I need? Okay, so what's the volume I have to have to get that much? Get the picture in your mind of this thing. You have a solution, you have a concentration of it. How much do I have to pour out until I have this much mass of that solute inside of there? Whenever you see the molarity, think of that as like a conversion factor. That's telling me something about how many moles per liter I've got. And so in this question, my, que my volume question is this. How many liters, let's say, because liters are part of my molarity definition. How many liters does it take to get 54.4 grams of H2C2O4? And here's something a little bit different in conversion factor so you'll know. I can put grams of H2C2O4 here. If I put liters up here, I don't know what to put in. What I do know is I could convert my H2C2O4 into moles by simply saying I'll put moles on top like that. Let me get this over here. And this is telling one mole is that. And if you add up H2C2O4, its molar mass is going to go right in here. Okay, and so that's 64 and 24 is 88, and it is 90, so there's 90 grams of this. If I stopped right now, I'd know how many moles of H2C2O4 I need, but I want to know how many liters. It's coming in a solution. So I have to do is put another conversion factor. I can string those out as many times as I want to. I put down moles of H2C2O4 here, and say that, and how many liters of solution up here. And for my definition of molarity, there are 0 0.819 moles in every liter. So all I have to do is take 54.4 divided by 90 divided by 0.819. That's all I have to work with. Okay, and so that will come out with my answer for this one. And do you want me to put it down? Let me put it down here. Um, it's going to be 54. I'm sorry, with my calendar, I didn't want to do that. Right there, calculator. I'm going to take this and take 54.4 I'm going to multiply I'm going to divide it by 90 and I'm going to divide it by 0.819 I get that so I get like 0 0.738 and so if I put that in as liters 0 0.738 is my answer and we put them in here put in 0 0.738 and over here put in units of liters just a capital L like that and hopefully I got that right I did it kind of in a hurry and I got it correct okay so um, it's just got that little extra conversion factor and if you want to think of it in pieces just think about converting your grams into moles first and then just using one conversion factor in it and then the last one I think is 5.20 yeah 5.20 so 5.20 is right here. 
And in 5.20, so the following equation represents the combustion of ammonia. What volume of liters of nitrogen form 136 liters? Let's look at this one for a minute, because here it gives us a balanced equation, doesn't it? All nicely balanced, don't have to worry about it from there. What volume of liters of nitrogen is formed? There's my nitrogen here. When 136 liters of ammonia is burned. So if I'm going to burn 136 liters of this, go back to my mole relationships, I want to know how much nitrogen I get. Notice that I get half as much nitrogen, don't I? They're in a 2 to 4 ratio. So if I burn 136 liters here, I'll get half that many liters over here, or 68, you know, whatever that is. 68, is that right? 120, yeah. 68 liters of nitrogen there, just half as much on that side. If I look at part B, it says, okay, so what volume in liters of oxygen is required to form 21 liters of water? I'm going to make 21 liters of water, and I want to know about my oxygen part. Notice they're in a 1 to 2 ratio here, that I need half as much oxygen as I had water. And so here, if this is 21 liters of water I'm going to make, I need half that many, I will use half that many liters of oxygen. So half of 21 is going to be 10 and a half. And those are my answers for that. Uh, I hope that helps out some. I know it's a little bit long, sorry about that. Uh, but I just felt like maybe it might help, and I'll get this thing posted in black. Thank you.